which I shouldn't say that because uh, uh, Jazz Raj Holland has come on the show. So conservatives are coming out. It must be because there's a leadership election or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I will start my introduction and then we'll jump into this. This is One Take Wonder. Uh, if at any time there's a question that you don't like, I will cut it out because I've done that with everyone. Uh, I just want to try and keep this so that way people can't accuse me of taking you out of context. Okay, okay. sounds good. Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host. And today we are pleased and honored to have the foreign affairs critic for the NDP in Ottawa, the member of parliament for the... Riding of Edmonton Strathcona, Heather McPherson on the show today. Uh, uh, I'm actually in awe that she took time out of her busy schedule as an MP to sit down with us and talk about things that are going on here in Alberta, in Ottawa, and particularly around the word, world in her role as foreign affairs critic. So Heather, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me. This is, this is a, it's a, it's a nice break from some of the things that are going on in the world that are, um, that are not going to be near as much fun to talk about as I hope this will be. Well, I, I completely understand, but I, I need to get the very first question out of the way. And I've asked every single politician who's ever come on this show uh, this question. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from, Heather? That's a great question, Chris. Um, you know, it, and it's so interesting to me. I mean, I've been a member of parliament since 2019. That's when I was elected. And when, when we think back on what those two years have, have been like for everyone, like I, I almost forget the, the initial pieces that that drove me to put my name forward because of course since then we've had you know this massive global health pandemic we've had international um you know with, there's a war in europe for the first time since world war ii you know the 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 challenges that we faced as a country and as a province and as a city have have changed so deeply um but for me a lot of it came from from i mean honestly i i'm scottish i think i have a bit of a background of like this whole things have to be fair it, it bit, you know, when I was growing up, I was the middle child with two brothers. And I feel like I was constantly saying, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. So I, I honestly think that drives me still. Um, I, I also thought, you know, I was asked to run um, multiple times before I agreed to put my name forward. And ultimately, what it came down to is that there is a lot of work that needs to be done in this country. There's a lot of um, things that aren't working for many, many Canadians. And the best way for us to solve those solutions is to roll up our sleeves and get to work. And, and what I wanted to do is make sure that there were people sitting at those tables, at every single table where these decisions were being made, that represented the people of Canada. So we don't need more you know, old white dudes in navy blue suits at those tables. We need women at those tables. We need uh, people that represent what Canada looks like across the, across the country. I wanted my daughter, who is a 16 year old girl in high school, to know that she has every right to sit at every single one of those tables um, as anyone else in this country. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't even account for the, for the privilege and the, the, the benefit I get from being, you know, a middle-aged white woman in this country. Like the, 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 the fact is that our, our parliament needs to be much more diverse and have much more um, opinions being brought to the table if we're going to actually achieve what we need to do for, for all Canadians. Um. I, I would usually go into a whole line of questioning around who you are, but I, I, there's a lot of things that are going on in this world and we have a short period of time with, with us together to get today. So I want to try and get to them. But before I do sure. get into the actual bigger issues, I want to talk about you for a little bit longer here for a second. So in 2019, you were elected for the very first time, uh, re-elected in 2020, 2021, sorry. Um, I wanted, I've asked this to a lot of politicians and I love their answers and I want to get you on the record of saying what your thoughts were, but being elected in as an MP has only happened to thousands of people. Not a lot of people have had the opportunity to step on the floor of the House of Commons and represent Canada at that level. I want, to, I want you to explain to me that very first moment when you walked into the House of Commons as the elected representative, uh, representative for Edmonton Strathcona and what was your thought and what was your initial reaction to that moment? Yeah, it's it's heavy. I mean, honestly, you're, you're making me choke up right now even thinking about it. Like to walk into the House of Commons and 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 to take your place um, and, and to sit in there, the, the awesome responsibility of that. Um, I, I remember thinking in my mind that I, I can't let this get old. I can't let 
I can't let this become routine. I can't, I can't let the role that I'm playing in our democracy and the history of this country um, become something that is commonplace to me, that, that every day I come here, I need to acknowledge that this is, that this is such important work. And I, and I need to acknowledge that me being in that place gives me the ability to have a voice but my voice is only worth something if I'm using it to, to lift up others, if I'm using it to make life better for others. That's the only reason that I'm in the House of Commons. Uh, I like to think that's why every one of those 338 members are in there. I, 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 in, a, in a perfect world, that is the case. Um, on my more cynical days, I may think that's not actually accurate, but, but I would think that we all went into politics. We may not agree on how, but but we should be trying to think about this role, this position that we've been given, this opportunity, this honor, how do we use that honor to make things better for people in Canada and around the world? Now, in 2019, you were kind of a uh, the, the oddball in Alberta uh, prevent, <laughs> of federal politics because you were the only uh, non-conservative MP elected, not only in Alberta, but Alberta and Saskatchewan. So when you talk about representing people's voices, did you have to take a little bit more of a responsibility to ensure that people who didn't vote for the Conservative Party in Alberta and even Saskatchewan had their voices heard in that Western bloc democracy that is so heavily favorite to the Conservatives? Mm -hmm. It was um, it, it's a it was a big responsibility. I mean, all Obviously, our electoral system in Canada is broken. There is no reason that you know 30 to 40 percent of a population should have one representative. Um, and I and I did feel that. You know, I did feel that there are there are thousands of people in Alberta and Saskatchewan that voted for a progressive um, representative who voted for somebody that that had the same values as as I have or that my party has, and they have no representation. So I did feel like there was um, a lot of weight there. I have I have made a point of working with my staff and working with my team to say that we will respond to when people write to me from around the province. I will raise issues in the parliament that are important to people outside of my constituency. You know, one of the big things I did in my very first parliament was bring forward legislation on coal mining. There isn't a coal mine in Edmonton Strathcona um that this isn't where coal mine I know what weird uh this isn't where coal mining is happening but it is something that is really important to Albertans and and I was the only one willing to bring this forward you know Pharmacare of all the members of parliament in this entire province one voted for Pharmacare um even though we know 80 percent of Albertans want Pharmacare like it it's outrageous wealth tax all these different things that that Albertans deserved representation on they didn't get unless I unless I raised my voice on it now uh, in, in the last line of question here around this subject um, in your time in your two and a half years since being elected first in 2019 you you've made it no uh, secret that some things that this current provincial government isn't the right thing uh, they're not doing the right thing and you've raised these concerns in uh the house of commons with the coal mining um why do you believe that people should be focusing in on what's happening here in alberta in ottawa because you think in ottawa you want to worry about the bigger picture and not just the small in like provincial matters but why do you feel like it's a big important push for yourself as the elected representative for edmonton strathcona to ensure that what's going on here in Alberta is heard? Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's a great question. And you're, you're right. I, I have raised issues of things that have been happening in Alberta a number of times. You'd laugh, like, honestly, Chris, you'd laugh so hard. But hand surge, so the, the written record of what happens in, in the House of Commons often says, you know, MP McPherson asks question, many members say, oh, because they, they, can't, they can't say they booed. So they just said, oh. <laughs> Um, so, so there's a few reasons. First of all, you know, jurisdiction is really funny with regards to our federation. So sometimes there is that overlapping jurisdiction. And when there is that overlapping jurisdiction it is very important that I'm speaking to it. So, so coal mining is a perfect example, because of course, uh, you know, coal mining in in Alberta is one thing when it impacts endangered species, it's federal when it impacts water when it's cross border, all of these things are are federal so so there is an overlap there healthcare is another perfect example 
delivery of healthcare is a provincial issue, but the Canada Health Act, uh, you know, means that there is some overlap in that in that jurisdiction. So, so there is ways that that it intersects. But more importantly, and and you know, we see this in terms of labor laws. We see this in terms of um, the privatization of our healthcare. The the things that are happening in Alberta uh, can spread. These can start to be things that move across the country. You know, when we see labor laws hurting workers, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the Doug Fords of the world, the Scott Moes of the world are waiting to see what happens, what the result is. How do labor and, and those supporting labor stand up for their rights in Alberta? And, and can those things be, be moved across the country? So I, you know, I go to caucus and I have regularly said, Folks, this is important. This is happening in Alberta. This is important because if we allow it here, it's coming to you. I may be the only one. Now there's two of us, but you know, we may not be the biggest caucus. The Alberta caucus may not be the biggest one at this table, but I'll tell you, it's going to impact everyone in the country if we don't stop things like this when they when they pop up in different regions of the country. So I, I just want to follow up on that because you raise an important point that sometimes uh, Alberta is the forgotten cousin in the confederation because uh it is so heavily dominated with conservative politicians that uh getting time on the house floor even in question period to raise alberta issues from a opposition standpoint it is hard and i've been watching the uh, question period uh over the last few months and i've noticed that yourself and your uh, fellow ndp blake i forget his last name i, I apologize there you mm-hmm. go um have been raising a lot of these uh, alberta issues are you are, as you're raising them, are you finding that this current government, let's just talk about the Trudeau government here for a second, the issues that you're raising are, fa- are falling on deaf ears when it comes to what's being addressed in the House of Commons when it comes to Alberta issues that are you and your fellow MP is raising? Because the Liberals do have two MPs as well in Alberta, but I have not seen MP from Calgary Skyview stand up in House Commons in 2022 yet to ask a question about what's going on in Alberta, but you've been there and you've been raising questions. So do you find that Alberta is falling on deaf ears when it comes to this liberal government? I think it depends. I mean, on some on some files, uh, no. And on some files, I think the government has done a good good job trying to work with the with the government. You know, the 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 NDP has been pushing for childcare for a really long time. Rachel did a lot of Rachel Notley did a lot of great work on childcare. So the fact that the federal government made that agreement and we have you know we have that in place, awesome. Uh, campus Saint John is another one. You know, this is the French campus that we require in our province if we're going to meet our charter charter obligations. The, the federal government came to the table with an agreement to pay for 95% of, of the first year's funding. Um, the provincial government has not come to the table. So in some areas, absolutely. In other areas, definitely we are, we are getting forgotten. You know, the, the biggest issue facing Alberta continues to be the diversification of our economy and, and finding a way to support workers and to support people as we transition off a very heavy oil and gas industry or um, economy to the future economy that won't that cannot depend as much on oil and gas and and it is going to take massive investment and we are not seeing a response that is that is um up to the task from the federal government on this you know i've written to the government many times to say if you are giving dollars to Alberta for diversification to, you know, for things like well cleanup or whatnot, you can't give it to the provincial government because they will give it to the CEOs, they will give it to the companies, it doesn't trickle down to the workers. And, and, and time and time again, we see it be given to CEOs and businesses and we still have orphan wells and we still don't have um, a, a strategy for workers in this province as we as we transition. So how do we change that? How do what what is the strategy to ensure that workers uh, do get their fair shot and fair due, and also have that transition away from oil and gas? And I, I don't say that as in like we need to do it tomorrow. Let's be honest, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen in a long period of time. And with the rise of what's going on in Europe, which we'll be talking about later, um, we will be seeing a potentially increase of Canadian oil and bitumen being moved. So how do we transition that? And what can the government do today to start that process? Well, I mean, first of all, 
I think that what we need to do is 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 to have a really clear recognition that this is the reality that we are in, and we can we can debate the time frames. We can debate, you know, how long we have to do this. But but you know, Premier Lougheed in 1972, that's the year I was born, said that we needed a better plan for diversification. We needed a better plan for Alberta so that we weren't so dependent, and that that can keeps getting kicked down the down the road. So the first thing we need to do is, is, a, is a real acknowledgement that this is where we're at. This is what needs to be done. And then there needs to be investment. And, and really, it is going to be massive. It, it has to be a massive investment. To, if we really, really want to help those workers transition uh, into new economies and you know, have investment in alternative energies like hydrogen, you know, like renewables, if we want to retrofit our buildings, if we want to be investing in transport and, and um, public transport across our cities and, and intercity transport, it's going to take some, some investment and, and it's worth it. It's, it's going to be required. Now, the other thing we need to do is we need our provincial government to stop getting in the way, frankly. You know, these cuts to post-secondary education, that's the wrong direction. The, the inability to see that there is alternatives to a, a one horse pony or, you know, one horse economy is baffling to me. Like they, they just are so, you know, if a, if a child's cartoon character says that oil and gas is bad, they go on the attack. Like really, let's think about some of those other alternatives that we can have. The economy is moving, let's, let's move with it. Let's not get dragged by it. Now, I, I want to. I was going to start off with what was happening here in provincially uh, with the Coots border and the Emergencies Act, but I want to start with more pressing news, and that is what's going on in Eastern Europe, uh, mm -hmm. Western Europe. Sorry, with Ukraine and Russia. You are just off of a international trip where you actually were in Poland for the last few, uh, if last, if I'm not mistaken, last week or the week before, um, meeting with. Uh, Polish uh, uh, parliamentarians meeting with Ukraine refugees, uh, talking to the people on the ground. Um, can you just talk, take a moment and tell us what's going on there? What did you hear when you were in Poland? And how can Canadians do more to help? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, it's been, it's been a hard, um, it was a hard week, certainly. We, we did go to, we flew into Warsaw and then traveled to the border uh, to, to meet with some of the Ukrainian refugees that were just coming over the border. This was a week ago, so at the very beginning, um, beginning-ish of the conflict. And, and I have to say, I mean, it just absolutely devastating stories. And, and from, from people that, that didn't see this coming, you know, I don't think very many of us expect you know, we all have been worried about this invasion, um, that Russia would do this illegal invasion of Ukraine, further invasion um, from what they did in 2014. We were all worried about that, but I don't think anyone expected the scale, the scope, the devastation, the brutality, the, the, the clear um, failure to, to meet international laws, the war crimes, you know, we didn't see any of that coming and it happened so, so fast. So some of the, some of the folks that I was meeting with, you know, these were, these were grandparents that were with their grandchildren and, and did not know where their children were and did not know if they would see them again. And, you know, don't speak English, don't have driver's licenses, had like a, a, a small suitcase with them. Um, you know, I was meeting, I met, this one always gets me, but I met this this woman, and it was her, her two very young daughters, and and her an eleven year old son. And her eleven year old son was trying to explain to me through a translator his plan for his family because he was the man of the family now. He's eleven years old, and he's he's holding on to a stuffy while he's explaining to me that that he, how he's going to take care of his family. You know, like I have a thirteen year old son, like that that's something I'll never forget that that's something I can't get get my head around so so the things that we saw on the ground are are horrifying and then you know one of the things that I've really been grappling with this week is this idea that as Canadians we need to do everything we can to help the people of of Ukraine we need to do everything we can to help them come to Canada to flee the the violence that, that's happening in their country to stop the violence in their country to to make sure that Putin is held responsible for these war crimes but but we also can't forget that 
six months ago, we promised the same thing to, to people in Afghanistan. You know, we still, we can't forget that there is, there is people in crisis around the world and, and we have not equally applied the rule of law and, and humanitarian um, law to, to crises around the world. So just for me, it's this overwhelming thing where we think we've really got to, we've really got to consider Canada's role in the world. We've got to consider what world um, order means and, and the world that we want going forward. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit calgarycaesarfest.com and get your tickets today. So what is our role? In your opinion, what is the role that Canada should be playing on a national stage right now? Because mm -hmm. um, we, we are seeing the prime minister, the deputy prime minister talk about sanctions and they, it, the sort of the international media has kind of alluded that Canada has been on the forefront of pushing for these sanctions against, Canada, uh, against Russia. But what is our role? We, we are known around the world as the peacekeeping country, as the, the Mike Pearson peacekeepers. Like we won a, peace, a Nobel Peace Prize for that. What should our role be in this, uh, uh, this, this new world that we are living in? Because I, I agree, we have failed on the Afghan file when we, were, we promised these refugees that we were gonna get them out and they helped us during the time in Afghanistan and we haven't done that. So what does our role need to be? Is it more of a free nation where refugees can come or is it more of that peacekeeping mission that we've uh, are known around the world as? Well, you know, I, I think it's I think it's both of those things. I also think it has to do with the the role we can play as a convener. I mean, let's it's it's not a surprise to anyone. We are not the biggest player. We are not the biggest <laughs> dog in the yard. Um, but but Canada has this long history of of punching above our weight. We have this long history of of being peacekeepers, of being conveners, of of being sort of that that honest broker that that could 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 leverage peaceful negotiations with other countries. But but I think it's important to remember, and, and, and I'm going to answer your question on what can be done now, but, but also I want to, I think it's important for us to get some context here, that over the last 15, 16 years, we have stopped being that country. You know, we have not played that role in the world stage, and, and Canadians still think we have, you know, we still sew Canadian flags to our backpacks, all those things still happen, but the reality on the ground is, is that our diplomatic core has been decimated, and I, and I don't blame the Liberals. Um, this was done under Stephen Harper. Now, the Liberals have not done what needs to be done to, to rebuild it. Um, you know, our foreign aid, our humanitarian aid has been decimated. Uh, you know, you talk about Pearson. Pearson was the was the prime minister who put in place the idea of giving 0.7% to overseas development assistance. We're less than 0.3 right now. Like, that's embarrassing. There are lots of other countries who are doing more. So our diplomatic core is, is poor. Our, our humanitarian response is poor. The, the prime minister that we, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau has promised that we would have a bigger role in peacekeeping. We've got an unbelievably small number of peacekeepers keepers in the field, despite promises that have been made, uh, you know, we, our, our obligations under trade, we haven't met at all. You know, we have Canadian companies working abroad that are, that are, that are, uh, you know, doing these unbelievably damaging environmental uh, human rights atrocities against people in other countries, and we're not holding them to account. So, so we're not that country anymore. And we need to get back to being that country because we could, we still have the, the potential there. Now, I really had felt under Justin Trudeau that he would, he would see that, like knowing who his dad was, knowing some of the history of, of our country. And even now I have hope that, you know, as, as his time as our prime minister sort of starts to come to a close, whatever, whatever timeline that, that is, 
that that he's going to be looking at his legacy and i and i hope that he recognizes we are in a multilateral world every crisis that is facing us is global in nature and and we don't appear to be prepared to engage in global solutions so i'm going to play a little devil's advocate before we get back to the the original statement that was uh, mm -hmm. what should what can't we do um that that's great i i understand that we are a nation that should be helping but I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, we have issues here at home that need to be solved as well. And I, I agree that we need to be doing more on the international stage, but we also need to be doing more here in Canada because we have homelessness really? that we have to address. We have people that are more divided in this country than we have ever seen in, in my time on this earth. So why, why, should we, why should we be worrying about the world when we can't even worry about ourselves properly? <laughs> And and don't don't get me wrong. I mean, I've worked in international development and foreign affairs for 25 years. This is the question we hear more than than any other question, of course. And 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 it it can't be a one or other anymore. That's not the way the world works anymore. You know, if anything, the fact that we're coming out of we're coming out of two years of being in a pandemic. The world is not coming out of being in two years of a pandemic. I mean, need to make that clear. But you know, the fact that that COVID happened is the perfect example. And I think Canadians recognize like, well, we don't work in a vacuum anymore. This doesn't, this isn't how trade works. This isn't how diplomacy works. Uh, things that happen around the world impact us. Uh, so, so of course, of course, we 100% need to be looking at things like housing in our communities. Um, I would suggest that we need to look at inequality as one of the overarching themes that would help with that. You know, like we shouldn't have, frankly, we shouldn't have billionaires at all. But we shouldn't have so many of them. We shouldn't have billionaires not paying their fair share. We shouldn't have billionaires that aren't contributing to our society. When, when you know, my office is right, right across the street from the mustard seed, and I see homeless, homeless people outside every single day in in frigid temperatures, trying to make ends meet in our communities in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, you know, you talk about the divide and how divided our country is right now. Well, we should have federal legislation put in place for for social media, for for online hate for misinformation and disinformation for cybersecurity. we don't have that stuff in place and and that work needs to be done too so i will i will never i will never say we should be working solely in in the global in the global sphere that that will never happen there's a lot of work that needs to be ha happening in canada simultaneously but surely surely our government can understand the obligations and the opportunities of doing both at the same time uh, I want to jump back to uh, uh, Ukraine here. Um, now that you're back, you're back mm -hmm. from seeing the devastation that has been going on because of uh, Vladimir Putin getting into Ukraine and basically destroying the country that is Ukraine. Um, what What is your role now to hold this government to account for what we can do more? Because as the foreign affairs critic for the NDP, your voice is more important now than it has ever been. And I'm not just saying yours, but the Bloc foreign affairs minister, uh, critic, the uh, conservative foreign affairs critic, because we mm -hmm. need to come together as a country to bring a solution that is going to help the people of Ukraine, but also be a Canadian solution. So what is your yeah. role and what do you see your role as now moving forward and working with foreign affairs minister Melanie Jolie? So first of all, I mean, I think that it's important to acknowledge that, that the government has taken some really important steps, um, has done some some good work on on this. And I and I'm actually quite proud of all parties because all parliamentarians have really come together and said, we need to do more for for Ukraine. We need to do more more. Canada needs to do more. Um, and that's great. You know, I think. Canadians don't want to see this be a moment in time where parliamentarians are bickering at each other and trying to, you know, have gotcha moments. So I'm, I'm quite proud of the way that everybody has worked together. However, my, my role um, as the NDP critic is to say these are the things that we think you can do more of. And, and the, the government has listened. You know, we have suggested a number of things that they have been able to, to put forward in, in their, they have implemented. And that's, that's great. You know, I love seeing today there was a further announcement of humanitarian aid and a matching donation uh, for the Red Cross. Fantastic. 
fantastic. Um, you know, we we have asked for further sanctions on some of those oligarchs that are very, very close to Putin. There's been a number of sanctions, much further and faster than than you know we could have we could have seen. So that's great. There's still more to be done because we know those that are extremely close to Putin are not still on that list. Uh, so we'll keep pushing on that. Um, you know, there are other pieces that we can do as Canadians to 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 have that strong response, um, but also. As, as the NDP critic, my role is going to make sure that the government does it because promises, promises are really easy to make, especially when it comes to humanitarian aid, especially when it comes to, um, you know, doing things long term. This is not going to be a short term recovery for Ukraine. This is going to require the, the international community to be there for the long haul. Um, and and. <laughs> Politicians aren't so great at the long haul sometimes. <laughs> sometimes we think in, in four year stints it, and in a minority government even less. Uh, so my role is to make sure that the government doesn't forget their commitments, uh, that we are there for the, the long haul. And that, like I said, that we don't forget our commitments to Afghanistan, that we don't forget our commitments to Tigray and Ethiopia and Yemen and you know Palestine. So so there are there are a number of things I think that I can do to hold that hold the government's feet to the fire a little bit and, and we'll keep working on that. Now, I, I want uh, one last question before we move on. And that is uh, here in Alberta, we have one of the largest oil reserves in all of the world. I think it's the top five in top five area, if I'm not mistaken. And that's all of Canada, I should say. Um, uh, Ukraine President Zelensky has said that we need to stop using Russian foreign oil because it is supplying Putin with money. Would you be advocating right here, right now, and even as your party is probably not fully for uh, pipelines to get our oil to market and building some pipelines? Or what is your view on getting our resources to market at this time? So, so there's, there's one there's one very sad reality that we're dealing with right now is we don't have that capacity and that capacity cannot happen very quickly. Like this is this is a five year, 10 year down the road solution, um, which is not a response to what is happening in Ukraine right now. Um, you know, I've done a lot of reading on this. It doesn't seem very likely to me that, that Europe was ever or ever will be a, a strong market for, for our, our energy resources. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so at this point, I don't know. It feels very much like when, when Premier Kenny, you know, tweeted that thing about what a great moment for Alberta oil and gas. You know, it, it feels like that's not the conversation we should be having right now. That is not a solution to, to what's happening. Um, in fact, I think this is a moment in time for us to be looking at our reliance on, you know, on foreign foreign fuel and not so much Alberta, but the, the world, the global reliance on, on energy sources and how how that puts us all in a very, very tricky position. You know, whether you're looking at energy, um, energy, energy reliance, yeah. or whether you're looking at nuclear disarmament, this has been a wake up call that we are being held hostage. We are being blackmailed by our reliance on, on um, the oil and gas and the energy resources from, from rogue states. It, it's not going to be the first time. It's, you know, it's not, when when we listen to Biden talking about the fact that he is considering getting oil and gas from Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, I, you know these are these are conversations where I think yeah absolutely Alberta energy should be used for those. But but building a pipeline right now to help with the problems that are facing Germany, I don't or Slovakia, I don't think that's the that's a reality for our for our current moment. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I, I appreciate your honesty and your candor on that one. And I want to move on to uh, more domestic issues right now. And 
this happened in January and February. It seems like 2022 has been a very long year and it's only March. Um, really long decade. Frankly. Yeah, <laughs> we are seeing uh, a more divided time. We had protesters across this country. We had protesters in downtown Ottawa and we had protesters here more locally in Coots, Alberta. Now I know you've raised this issue in the House of Commons but I want to get your opinion on and your, uh, your, your, your sort of thinking behind how we can be better as a country to come together because we are seeing a more divided time. COVID-19 is not gone. As much as people want it to be gone, it's not gone. And sometimes things have to be in place to make sure that people like myself who are in my compromise that we don't get more sick. I had my uh, surgery canceled for cancer because our hospitals were overrun with people in it because of COVID-19. And I understand that people are upset because prices are going up and truckers can't get across the border and vaccines are the best way to do that. I, I know people, depending on which way you stand, vaccines are the best way. I, I'm going to say that over and over again until I die, but that's the best way to go forward. How do we get through this as a united country? Because I've never seen more vile and hate spewed in the last two months than I have my whole life. Yeah, I, I hear you. And first of all, I just want to say I'm really sorry about having your surgery and the impacts on you personally. Um, the, these are terrible. These are terrible stories. I mean, this is, that's a terrible. It's a terrible thing to have to go through and then to have delays. You know, I think. I think first of all. I think that's important to recognize. The second thing is, is can I just echo your comment on vaccines? Like I've worked in international development for, for 25 years. Uh, there are three things that, that really help with human health and they are clean water, good food and vaccines. I mean, the fact that they are free in this country is, is, a, is a true gift. The fact that medicine developed them so fast is a, is a true gift. Um, and there are people around the world that I would really, want to have access to vaccines that don't. But that said, uh, you, you're, you're asking about this divide. You're asking about the, the, the disenfranchisement, I guess, of so many Canadians that we're seeing. Um, and, and I think, you know, you're right. Like so many of us want to be done with COVID and that's not how it works. You know, it's, it, you, you don't just get to say you're, you're done. And it's and it's over. It's not it's not like Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy. You know, it's not that's not what we're dealing with here. It's not the way it works. Um, but but I do think that there's been there's been forces at play that have made that division worse. Uh, you know, we have seen politicians and at all levels, municipal, federal and and um, provincial who have used this as a wedge issue, have used this as a dog whistle and and it's not helpful. It has not helped. Um, it has not helped our country. It has not helped us come forward. Uh, we have seen um, online misinformation and disinformation use this moment to of, of people feeling very lost to 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 almost weaponize people. Uh, you know, the 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 what we saw in Ottawa, regardless of how likely it was to succeed was an attempt to overthrow an, a democratically elected government in Canada. Now you can say that it didn't have any chance of succeeding and that these guys don't worry, they were peaceful. They had a hot tub and a pig roast and a jumpy castle. But, but I can also tell you that, that my uh, Muslim young female staff person could not come to her office. I wouldn't let her come to her office because I couldn't keep her safe. Um, I've spoken to, to black parliamentarians. I've spoken to people of color and indigenous people who work in the bureaucracy who could not go to their job um, because they because of those those protests. So I, know, gonna, I, gonna, I think I'm there's gonna, stuff I'm there. Gonna, I'm going to pause for a second because I want to make okay. sure I, I get this correct. And I don't want you to be a, a, someone to accuse you of saying one thing. Are you saying the protesters that were in Ottawa were white supremacists, that they were targeting people of color, Muslims, Black? There were people within that protest that were white supremacists. And, and I would not for any at any moment say that that was all of them. I think there were people there that had been brought along um, perhaps unintentionally, almost guaranteed unintentionally, standing with white supremacists. 
but white supremacists were there. They had Confederation flag, Confederation flags. They had uh, swastikas. Uh, they were in that crowd. They were they were part of that. I mean, Pat King, my God, the things that Pat King has said, and he was one of the leaders of of that convoy. Um, so so a hundred percent. I'm saying that. You I just want, I just wanted to clarify that because I just I don't want someone to listen to this and be like, oh, she's calling us all uh, racist and misogynist. And I, I I understand. I knew where you were coming from. I just wanted to clarify that for the show. Um, thanks for thanks for making that clear. And and the same thing with coots. I mean, <coughs> seriously, we saw symbols of um, Islamophobia. We saw you know we saw hate symbols in those convoys. And that is not in any way to say that that is every person in that convoy. Um, but we did see that that was there. There was, there was an attempt to murder RCMP officers like that is, that well, is what happened in our not province. Mistaken, there was body armor, there were guns, uh, uh, like seized at with one of the protesters at Coots. And I know you brought this up in the House of Commons. Um, I, I don't want to say this out loud, but it, 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 it has been in the back of my head for a long time. It seems like we are coming to a moment where someone is potentially going to die if we don't do something to unify this country. And I don't want yeah. to say that as a bad thing, because I really hope that doesn't happen. But we are more divided. We seem to be more regionalized than we have ever been. West versus East, Quebec versus Alberta, BC versus Alberta. It seems like we are more divided than we have ever been. And you, you talk about the rise of uh, divisions in the House of Commons with the gotcha questions. And I try not to do that here on the show. And that's what I tried. Mm -hmm. That's what my whole idea is, is not to do those. But if our politicians won't sit down and have an honest conversation without those yelling and 15 second sound bites that we all see on social media after a question period, how does that reflect to unify the country when mm -hmm. the, the more we go on, the further divided we are? hundred percent. I agree with you. One thing I just want to clarify, though, we say that this is more divided than ever, and that may very well be true, Chris, but I also think that it's really important we acknowledge that the BIPOC people have been saying that we have a race problem in this country for a long time, um, that the people have been talking about the, the armed militias in southern Alberta for a long time. Uh, it may have become more apparent to, to folks like me who, who don't have that lived reality, uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge that this is not new, um, that this that there have been white supremacy movements in Canada for a very, very long time. There has been domestic terrorism in this country for a really long time. Um, and, and I will say, I mean, we, we, I will say that COVID has played a role, but, but you know, Trump a lot... <laughs> I hate to always blame everything on Trump. I even hate saying his name, to be perfectly honest. But there was this movement to allow, this became a much more acceptable view. It became, you can talk, you could talk about these views that, that I think previously were just considered so abhorrent that you wouldn't. And, and somehow those, those white supremacist views, those, those horrific views need to become abhor abhorrent again. They, you know, they need to be put back in the, 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 you know, I, I don't know that we can actually stop, stop them from being the views of, of a very small minority of people in Canada, but, but they need to stop feel, feeling that they're empowered to, to share those views. That's, that's part of it. Um, but in terms of how to stop the division, how to start the conversations, it is having, having discussions and it is being face to face. And I will say that when I was a parliamentarian for the, for the very brief time before COVID hit, I realized very quickly a lot of work happens that, frankly, no work happens in question period, but a lot of work happens in the corridors, in the hallways, in the committee rooms, in that's where you meet with people, that's where you build those relationships, that's where you, you can, you can, um, you know, come up with compromise and ways to move forward. And so, so that's something that that has been a, a victim of COVID. We haven't had the opportunity to do that. And I think when that opportunity opens up again, hopefully very soon, that will help that, you know, being able, it's a lot harder to, to look someone in the eye, um, you know, to know their family, to have, have spent time with them and, and see them as the enemy than it is when all you're doing is looking at people over a screen. It's a lot easier to do that. But I also think social media, we need, we need um, online hate legislation 
this is where the vast majority of radicalization is happening. It needs to be legislated. It, it can very easily be legislated. You know, if if Facebook can sell me a pair of Adidas five minutes after I say the word Adidas in my kitchen, uh, I'm pretty sure they can they can stop you know broadcasting mass murders. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump on that here for a second because I love this conversation because I, and I, I know we're running out of time here, but I want to just get this on. Uh, we have something in this country called freedom of speech, though, and that's the great thing about our country. We have the right to say what we want, and I agree that we do need online hate uh, legislation that stops it. And let's be honest, protesting legislation, because when I got married, we had protesters outside our we our uh, wedding venue at the Glenbow Museum here in Calgary saying we're going to hell because we're homosexuals, and well... Thanks for the pick me up on my wedding day, guys. But yeah, no uh, we kidding. still went Thanks through with great it. Photo album. <laughs> exactly. Um, so how do you balance that? How do you balance freedom of speech against online hate? Because you can't have one without the other. You can't have freedom of speech without online hate. You can't have online hate without freedom of speech. So how do you balance yeah. that? <laughs> We've got a charter of rights and freedoms. I mean, we we can we can very easily determine what is you know the even even the the youngest child understands that your rights end when they impede on the rights of someone else. I mean that, of course, it's going to be contentious. You know there is a reason why the government has not brought this legislation forward because you know we saw what happened under C10 last last um, Parliament where it was weaponized by. I'm, I can be I can be partisan, right? It was weaponized yeah. by the conservatives as yeah. a fundraising tool. You know, realistically. Um, it, it, that's not what it was going to do, but that's that's how it was weaponized. And so I know why they haven't brought it forward, but it still does need to be done. Why you know, doesn't the, 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 the benefit of sorry? Why doesn't the NDP do it in a private motion, private members bill? Well, we have. I mean, we bring forward private members motions all the time. Like I just sponsored Peter Julian's one on online um, and symbols of online uh, symbols of hate. Sorry, yeah. uh, that we bring forward, but we can't. I can't bring forward legislation until it's my turn. I'm bottom of the, the heap. You know, these have to be things that the government brings forward. And frankly, if there's any money attached to it, I can't bring it forward anyway. It needs a royal royal assent. And, and you know, we're yeah. not allowed to do that. So the, being the government means you have all sorts of, of, you know, you get all sorts of stuff, right, when you're the government. But you also have to do the work. Like That's also part of it. Um, if, I, if if I could bring forward that legislation, table it and have people vote on it tomorrow, I would 100%. Oh, well, let's, let's maybe hopefully so elect, elect NDP next election. There, there you go. go. Uh -huh. uh, I, I have one last set of questions and I know we're running out of time here, but I want to make sure that we talk about inflation because it is a massive thing right now. A lot of people, uh, we, we, we jokingly said during the coots and the Ottawa protests that supply management, supply uh, issues was a word that no one spoke about until this happened. And it seems like inflation seems to have come out of the blue and a lot of more people are saying it because prices are going up and i think everyone will see that at the price pumps right now how, how do we fix this um cost of living is going through the roof cost of housing is going through the roof and i know that you and your ndp colleagues have been making housing a major issue right now because mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't able to afford a house how do we fix the inflation issue in five minutes <laughs> in five minutes oh my god <laughs> Oh, shoot. Or as, <laughs> a, as long as sleeves. you want, but that's, a, I just want to make sure we don't run into your well, next meeting. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, realistically, the inflation is one of our biggest things. And one of the things that we have to look at is the causes of it. And, and, you know, I talked about inequality already. I talked about how our system of taxation, our system of, um, you know, allowing the ultra wealthy to continue to benefit has, has really got us to a situation where we're at housing in in Edmonton you know if you're buying a house is maybe not the worst in the in the country you know we're we're still not Toronto we're still not Vancouver but 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 in terms of people's ability in terms of young people's ability to buy a house it's almost non-existent um so we need to be looking at what the strategies are from a bunch of different fronts where do we get affordable housing how do we make it affordable housing that's got wraparound supports for people who require it what about co-op housing um can we be investing in co-op housing options can we be investing in um building more housing stock reusing the stock in our in our um cities that is not being used right now as people are working from home and as 
people as the nature of work transitions. Is there things there? And, you know, in terms of the housing, the, the key one, I've talked to, to our mayor, Amarjeet Sohi, and the key thing that we need to look at is, is the, the, you know, the government has promised us an Indigenous housing strategy developed by Indigenous people. Uh, we still don't have that. We still haven't seen that. Um, that's another piece that we can be looking at to lower these prices. The, the, the skyrocketing prices in some of our bigger urban centers, why don't we have legislation that will, in effect, stop people from using this, these as, as investments? Housings aren't, housing is not an investment. That's not what it should be, what we should be looking at. Um, and then we're looking at things right now. I'm part of one of the task forces within the, within the NDP that's looking at things like, you know, a jobs guarantee. How do we make sure people have the ability to do, to, to work? How do we make sure that that can happen? Um, you know, to look at our taxation systems. You know, right now, Jason Kenney just this week um, promised to reduce 13 cents on, on a liter of, of gas. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the Klein bucks, you know, like it's like Ralph bucks. It, it feels to me like this is not actually a strategy. This is perhaps a strategy to win a, a leadership, leadership review. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, guys. I, I'm biased. I'm not biased. I'm not biased. What are you talking about? So, so the, the, the things that we can do, I mean, some of it has to do with COVID, 100%. Some of it is, is we're seeing around the world that these are implications that are happening around the world. Um, the, 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 the influx of supports for people and, and the printing of, of money, and you, you know, some of that's, that's legitimate and it's just the way it's going to be and we had to do it and it's, it's necessary. But now let's look at the way to make things a little less, um, a little less unequal. Let's think of those strategies that we can take. And, and that's more than five minutes, but I can keep going if you want me to. No, no, I appreciate that. And like I said, we will we will have to have you on for uh, back on for another episode to talk about inflation, about the other issues that are going on, because um, too much. Work, yeah, we have too much to go over it, the work that's going on in Ottawa right now as an MP must be hard. It must be challenging and must be divisive because, like I said, we do live in a very polarized time right now. But um, Heather, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, this has been an honor and a pleasure to sit down with someone of your caliber and chat, uh, open, honestly, and uh, just, uh, just it feels like we're good friends. And <laughs> I say that to all my guests, but you seem like it seems like we're really good friends right now. But thank you so much for doing Thanks, this, Heather. Chris. Much appreciate it. Yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, next, uh, let me know when you're when you're free next time. There you go. So with that, everyone, as you probably have heard this before, if you've listened to the show or watched the show, uh, the links to Heather's uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, website are in the show notes. Please check them out. Follow along. Uh, and uh, just remember, guys, I, I say this all the time, but I, I keep on saying this and I, you know why, but get out from behind Twitter, get out from behind social media and have a conversation with somebody. It's a weird concept, but have a face 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 to face conversation with somebody because it actually does make our society and democracy a lot better. So with that, everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember guys, just keep talking.